Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of MEEP members, making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans. Live from St. Paul, Minnesota, we welcome you to another season of Your Legislators, a roundtable discussion featuring state lawmakers who are prepared to answer your questions and discuss important issues affecting citizens of Minnesota. Here's your moderator for tonight's program, Barry Anderson. Good evening and welcome to this week's version of Your Legislators. We're delighted that you have joined us on this February Thursday evening. And we have for you, as we do each week, a distinguished panel of guests to help unravel the mysteries of St. Paul. We, of course, invite you to join our program electronically by sending messages to the email address given on your screen or by calling your questions in to our uh, panel of uh, volunteer operators that... Uh, are there to take those questions and see that they get to our panel uh, to have our discussion, not only this night, but throughout all the weeks ahead until we go home, whenever the legislature goes home, and maybe we'll have a little discussion about that. <laughs> I also want to remind you that uh, we, are, um, we, are we are fully involved in this electronic era. You can find us on Facebook uh, and who knows, uh, probably some other social media well, none of which I can operate, but that's the way it goes. Let's begin with the introduction of this panel that I talked about earlier to my immediate left. Our most veteran legislator from Crystal, District 45B, Representative Lyndon Carlson. Representative Carlson, we're delighted to have you with us. We were having a little conversation before we started about uh, how long you've been here. Can you share with our viewers how long that's been? Sure. I was elected in 1972, so this January I started my uh, 40th year. And I'm tied with one other member in terms of being the most senior member of actually both houses. Phyllis Kahn, I suppose? Yeah, Phyllis Kahn and I. And uh, Phyllis has a take on it, though, because the first roll call is alphabetical and C comes before K, so she says I'm the more senior member. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> Tell our viewers a little bit about the committees you're serving on this session. And sure. I uh, serve on the Ways and Means Committee, and I'm the uh, ranking uh, or lead Democrat on uh, that committee, and I serve on taxes, and then I also serve on the Capital Investment Committee. And I understand that's going to be one of our key topics here tonight. As a matter of fact, we've got a question from a viewer about that. And when we're done with the introductions, we're going to go right to bonding. Also joining us this evening, a frequent guest on our program, District 4, <laughs> Linden, Minnesota, Senator Keith Langseth. I think we were discussing, Senator Langseth, that in all probability this might be your last appearance with us. Am I right about that? It, it, it will be, yes. I am now the oldest and the longest serving in the Senate, so... Uh, I kind of thought it was probably time to move on. <laughs> tell our, tell our, well, I certainly am not going to second that motion, but you tell our viewers a little bit about your service, how long you've been serving, committees you're serving on, things of that sort. Well, I served in the House of Representatives for four years before I, uh, I served in the Senate, and then I was out for two years, and now I've served for 32 years in, in the Senate. I, I'm on the Finance Committee, the Rules Committee, the Environment and Natural Resources Committee, and the Capital Investment Committee. Well, we're delighted that you uh, you have joined us this evening, and um, we'll miss you next year. So uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tune in. See, there you go. You're going to be able to watch us. You won't have to actually be here. Uh, also joining us from Rochester, District uh, 29, Senator Dave Senjum. Senator Senjum, thanks for joining us. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and um, what you're doing in the legislature. Well, I uh, grew up in Hayfield, Minnesota. Spent, uh, oh, gracious, uh, most of my adult life in Rochester, uh, Worked a career at Mayo Clinic, uh, joined the legislature in 2003, and uh, have uh, obviously been here ever since. Uh, serve on taxes, uh, the Capital Investment Committee, and uh, chair the Rules Committee. And uh, occupy uh, and have a leadership role in the Senate as well. So well, I guess that's what they say. That's <laughs> <laughs> and we're delighted, that, uh, delighted that you're with us. And finally, another veteran of our program. We, uh, we have uh, all four veterans tonight uh, from District 4B, Walker, Representative Larry House. Representative House, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Well, actually, I was born and raised and grew up in South Minneapolis. Uh, so I know that area well, and I, I don't get lost. Reverse, in the, reverse migration or something. Yes, and I don't get lost in the Twin Cities too often because I know it reasonably well. Uh, I've lived up in Walker for about 20 years. I chair the Capital Investment Committee. I'm on Ways and Means, the Rules Committee, and Jobs and Economic Development Finance. 
So do we dare ask you what part of South Minneapolis you came from originally? Uh, yeah, it's South Minneapolis, about eight blocks from the Vets Hospital. Or a six very, blocks very from Minnehaha town. Falls. Yes. I, I grew up in uh, the same general area. Well, see, there you go. It's, uh, <laughs> we'd, uh, we'd, uh, we'll, we'll look for questions from that part of South Minneapolis today. See, <laughs> well, see we can probably answer them, too. Yes. We might be able to. Yes. Yeah. All right, let's talk about bonding and capital investment. A viewer from St. Paul, Minnesota, wants to know which uh, proposed bond issues in, are likely to be the highest priority this session. Uh, and um, we'll start with the veteran side, of the most veteran side of the table. Maybe we'll start with you, Representative Carlson. Well, I think it's important to remember that, uh, you know, the bonding bill is... Uh, a bill put together with several different areas, and uh, always a, a major part of the bill is uh, higher education because of our responsibility to our colleges and universities. But uh, having said that, uh, obviously there are proposals that are very important that impact on uh, other aspects of uh, state government as, as well, although as a general rule, uh, the higher ed part of the uh, bill is usually the largest. Yes, uh, higher ed is usually something like 35 percent of the of the bill, and of course, with Minsk U having 53 campuses and the university having uh, several campuses, uh, there's a lot of buildings to keep up. So we have to keep spending in, in the area of 200, 250 million every uh, bonding cycle in order to keep those those building up, buildings up. And, and then sewer systems, uh, they're very, very important. Uh, and then bridges, and uh, from my area, flood control is very, very important. Uh, so those are kind of the basics, and then some of the DNR funding and, and so on. Are there specific projects, uh, you know, based on your, I mean, I, I think you've been working with capital investment for decades, actually. Uh, are there specific projects that come to mind? I think one of the questions a viewer had was, uh, are there specific projects that uh, you think are likely to be included or perhaps are very unlikely to be included? Well, it's specifically, I, it, with the higher ed, there's just a big, long list. Mm -hmm. And we have the asset preservation, which uh, uh, usually runs something like uh, 40, 50 million dollars. Uh, but then there's, there's different. When it comes to the Minsk U projects, usually uh, uh, most of them are total renovations of existing buildings. Like at Moorhead State, there were, uh, there were two buildings built in 1932, and we just got done run totally renovating the the second one. Beautiful old buildings, but every once in a while you have to just tear them all apart and put them back together again. Senator Sengem, buildings, bonding, and so forth? Well, I, uh, I think most of it's been said. Uh, you know, the bill is uh, going to, you know, be reasonably strong, certainly in the area of higher education. It always has been. Uh, I think it probably should be. And, uh, you know, we're trying to educate our future. And, and Senator Lanks had said we have huge investments out there. And, uh, and you just need to keep these things up uh, uh, or consciously decide that you're not and, uh, and let them go. But that's not the case. We've got commitments there. We need to take care of them. Uh, certainly roads, bridges, uh, wastewater infrastructure, floods. Uh, uh, maybe if I had a personal favorite, I really do like the uh, Hormel Institute uh, expansion in Austin and uh, uh, a lot of uh, medical research uh, componentry going into that facility already. And we could uh, maybe frankly, expand it, and uh, they do great work. Representative Howes, your thoughts? Well, they've touched on almost everything. They didn't leave me a whole lot. <laughs> but I, I will say this. Every it's a very talented panel. <clears throat> every project is important to someone, somewhere. But I think what, what they did miss is the 700-pound gorilla, and that's the capital restoration. They, they expect $241 million. I realize the governor really didn't specify in his bill. He would wish that the legislature would do something. I believe we need to. How that will fit in the whole picture of things is a little too early to tell, but I really believe that a large chunk will be in the bonding bill, maybe on top of what we're allowed to spend. You know, I, I think uh, we've all kind of touched on it, uh, what we call HEAP or what the average citizen might recall or refer to as repair and betterment. You know, we, we want to make sure we preserve our current assets. And uh, for example, when we were talking about higher education, you'll notice that the number one request for the University of Minnesota as well as Minskew is their HEAPA request or the repair and betterment. You know, they want to make sure that uh, we don't have leaky roofs that mean that you're going to have greater costs later and, uh, you know, those kinds of issues. And I thought of that when uh, 
Representative Howells rep uh, mentioned uh, the Capitol, you know, that yeah. um, is at the point where it's uh, 100 years old now and yeah. uh, it needs a fair amount of work if we're going to preserve it as a major asset in the state of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Senator Sengem, there was a reference in the governor's State of the State speech to uh, kicking everybody out of the Capitol for four years, uh, which I gather has something to do that, uh, that, that wasn't, I don't think he was expressing a preference there. I think that was to, to deal with the reconstruction issues. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about, from your perspective as a, as a caucus leader, um, Senate Majority Leader, where that, the question of repair to the yeah. Capitol sits? I mean, I, I think it'd be operationally really difficult to do that. Uh, uh, and, and I don't think you need to do it. I, th I think you can, uh, if, if you're going to, if, frankly, if you're going to do that full uh, $240 million, first of all, I don't know how you do it in, in an existing, you know, single bonding bill unless you just virtually directed half of it, so to speak, to, to the capital itself. Uh, that would be one challenge. Uh, but uh, you, you, even if you did, it just seems to me if you're going to go down that road, you, 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 need to, you need to sectionalize the capital and and uh, take one section at a time, uh, renovate it, uh, move some people over to another part. Yes, it's going to be constricted, but but uh, make it work. Uh, we always did it in Mayo, and you can do that and 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 make it through that. And it probably it probably then becomes maybe a, who knows a, a, a ten to twelve year project. But uh, it, it's uh, it, it, the idea of leaving for four years. It's it's almost inconceivable to me. House? Well, I've had some good discussions with the uh, architect, and I've spent my whole life in the construction industry, and I believe it can be done in four years, and they'll do it in sections or wings from the bottom to the top, which means a wing would maybe have to be shut down. But I do have a bill drafted that I'm not going to introduce for a while until we have, until we have the forecast, but my thought was if we give them $191 million spread over four years, don't know exactly what the increments would be. The architect w could put in some information to that. We leave the rest of it, uh, and, and the, uh, the other caveat would be that this money could only be used for structural integrity, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, et cetera, et cetera, flooring, but no uh, window enhancements, no drapery, no brass lamps no uh, artwork or painting, and that would come possibly from another fund. And then the other caveat I, I have in the draft, and again, this is just a draft for people to look at later, is that if they were to shut down the House and Senate floors, it would only be for one session during an even-numbered year. So we could, if we chose, not have session during an even-numbered year, whether that would be 2014 or 16. We've um, <clears throat> done different things uh, during my uh, time when we talk about vacating various facilities. Uh, we redid the state uh, office building. I think that was back in the mid-80s. Mm -hmm. Mechanic Arts High School was very close to the uh, Capitol complex. The uh, so court building actually sits on there, I think. That's right. Yeah. And uh, But at that time, uh, the uh, House, both minority and majority, and then the uh, minority senators, we officed over at Mechanics Arts high school while the restoration was going on, but we did have a facility in close proximity to, you could use. Uh, the other example was that the House Chambers was redone a number of years ago, and uh, there was actually a period of time, believe it or not, where we shared uh, space with the uh, Senate. Mm. And it was kind of interesting. You had two members at each desk, um, and it was for a very short period of time. But there are examples where we did uh, do some sharing back and forth during uh, restoration and remodeling. Senator Links, have any thoughts on this? Well, the architects involved have have done others before. The one uh, redid the uh, Utah uh, Capitol, so I think they kind of know how they can make this this thing work. It's going to be an interesting process. We'll be interesting to see what, if anything, happens uh, in the course of this session. All right, let's move on to some other questions from uh, from our viewers. We've got a viewer from St. Paul who's concerned about House File 1776, which we've been able to determine has to do with the market value or restoring of the market value homestead credit. We've had some conversation about that in the past weeks. Uh, who wants to take a run at that? Anybody? Well, uh, I know that uh, there are many members uh, that uh, do want to see that uh, restored because of the uh, impact on the uh, property tax. I happen to be uh, one of them. and. Uh, I would hope uh, before we're done this session that uh, we can accomplish that. 
it does have a uh, fairly significant uh, price tag, but I think that's one area that uh, a whole lot of people in the general public are concerned about uh, seeing restored. Mm -hmm. I think at some point it's going to be restored. It might not end up being the very same way it has been before. But uh, like in my part of the state, uh, you know, first of all, people were worried about what happened to housing taxes. But then there was this shift of valuation over onto to farmland and, uh, and businesses. My house went up 4.3 percent, and then my farmland went up 18 percent. So the, I think we got to redo it, not necessarily this session. Um, we probably don't have enough money, but I think we've got to take a better look at it because the way it was set up, I don't think uh, is working very well. Well, I, yeah, and a lot is going to depend on our February forecast, I think, in terms of of, uh, of where this thing goes, if it's able to go anywhere. Uh, February forecast should come out, uh, I don't know, a day or two into the early March. Uh, I think there is a date, I just don't rec recalling it, but uh, we're, going to, we're going to need to take a look at that and see what's available in terms of of dollars, uh, be honest, we've talked about it uh, uh, frequently, but it, it all kind of boils down to do we have the money to do it or can we find it? And uh, But I think, you know, as we, as we move towards the end of the session, uh, that is certainly going to be something uh, that uh, we look hard at. Representative Howes? Well, I, I don't believe the market value of credit will be brought back, but I believe there will be some adjustments and fixes to it. There has to be. I know that Cass County, my county, and uh, Morrison County were hit rather hard just because of how the arithmetic and the math and, and the uh, tax capacity worked. I have people who uh, have homes valued between seventy-two and $92,000 whose taxes went up a thousand percent. Now when I talk to people in the cities and the suburban areas, they say, well, what did they actually pay? Well, on the county line, not counting all the other things on your taxes, maybe fifty dollars, but it went from fifty to two fifty. That's a thousand percent increase. So, it's not right that it should be that. And uh, but they criticize and say, "Well, that's nothing. That's not very high." But I remind them, you have public, uh, you have water and sewer and police and fire and libraries and curb and gutter. We have septic systems and, and wells and no fire and no libraries. So we're not paying for those those things. So that, that's why our property taxes are lower on the county line. You know, I uh, find the number of that bill rather interesting, 1776. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> um, there are certain numbers, as we were saying before the program, that uh, certain house files that you remember, I referenced one that I remembered from 40 years ago, and we had a budget balancing bill, uh, I think it was four years ago, uh, 1812, the War of 1812. <laughs> did, they, so did they play the overture that. every time the bill was uh, called? There, there, there were some that thought we should. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a, quite a difference, too, in the percentage increase in rural Minnesota <clears throat> versus metro. I think yes. it was 2.6 percent metro and over 8 uh, percent in the rural area. So. Uh, that, and that, of course, caused us some problem out in the rural area. Yes, it rural did. Area. Yeah. The, yeah. Though the other thing to remember, that's an average over the whole metro area, and uh, there are parts of the metro area where that percentage is quite a bit different sure. uh, depending on the uh, property yeah. tax situation in any given municipality. Yeah. One of the things about our viewership is that it is perhaps better informed about DNR issues and uh, uh, wildlife uh, resource issues than it uh, viewers you're going to find anywhere else. And a viewer from Appleton wants us to talk about uh, whether we approve of having the wolf season overlap the deer season. And uh, oh I, uh, I'll, I'll turn to you, uh, Re Representative Howes. Maybe you can uh, start with that on that issue. I'm going to let the DNR make that call uh, if they ask for my input. I don't have enough input to give them as to whether they should have the seasons overlap. I would say just uh, first blush, no. Uh, figure it out. It could be just before, just after. Uh, but I think the best time to have a wolf season is after deer hunting season and talk to all the local farmers that have calves, that have cows, and you ask if you can hunt on their property, and I'm sure they would love it, and I'm very <laughs> sure you'll see a timber wolf. <laughs> Any other thoughts on that issue? I think we're going to yield to the experts on that. Yes. We're going to maybe all need a little more advice. Yes. 
All right, viewer from Crookston wants to talk about the, um, the I knew we wouldn't get very far before uh, stadiums and gambling and whatever would come up, and here we go. A viewer from Crookston wants to talk about the, wants us to talk about the White Earth Tribe uh, proposal. Um, and and uh, uh, I'll just read the question as it's provided. The White Earth Tribe wants to split $300 million per year for the entire state, and the tribe gets the other $150 million f uh, for uh, 20 to 30,000 members. This viewer doesn't think that seems fair. Um, a viewer from St. Paul, however, feels that we should, in fact, uh, authorize the building of a new casino dealing with the White Earth proposal. Uh, near the stadium, and both could benefit users. Um, it's been one of the topics that's been floating around. Who wants to take a run at it? Well, I had the very same propo proposal for the Twins quite a number of years ago, and it was talked about for a while and then rejected. We never actually had it out on a floor vote or anything like that, but I did suggest that as a, as a possibility, and I, I, I would kind of guess it won't get any further now than it did with the Twins. Other thoughts? Well. I'll, I'll go this far. You might be able to answer that question better because of what you do in your spare time, whether or not this is going to uh, be constitutional, work with the compact, violate the compact. So I'm going to leave that question to you. Sir. Well, yeah, you, you, the chances I'm going to answer that are uh, uh, slim and none. It's exactly, slim count. yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so I'll just say, it, it, I think it's, you know, it's kind of intriguing, and it wasn't but an hour ago somebody was talking about, you know, the Arden Hill site with a, White Earth uh, Casino there, and uh, and wouldn't that uh, wouldn't that work nicely? And it it, it it seems a little late to the to the table, and uh, they haven't been here. But you know, this thing is not over, and uh, who knows where it's going to go if, if 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 it goes anywhere at all. So I'm talking about the whole Viking, right, the whole the whole, the whole, the whole, the whole discussion on on this issue. So you know, there've been uh, go ahead. There've been yeah. several uh, yeah. gaming issues that have been put yeah. on the table, and. Um, one of the issues, if you're going to tie that to the Viking Stadium, which a lot of people try to do, is uh, whether or not they would uh, stand a uh, test, if you will, with the bond houses and how they would perceive it. And if there were a court case, uh, that would uh, tie up uh, the construction potentially of a, of a stadium. So there's some question about the reliability of the uh, gaming revenue in terms of how the bond houses would look at that. And then secondly, if uh, it became a legal issue, uh, then uh, those that are proponents of the stadium might not see it move forward as rapidly as they yeah. would like. Our viewer from St. Paul wants to know about the status of that stadium bill. Does anybody care to, care to venture a guess as to where we're at at this moment in time? Well, you know, I, uh, there's an interesting thing, and in, uh, maybe the senators can speak on the Senate side, but, you know, there have been all of these uh, newspaper stories and negotiations going on between uh, various... Uh, legislators and the administration, but uh, to date on the uh, House side, there's never been a legislative hearing uh, because there really hasn't been a no. consensus on uh, uh, what the uh, location would be or what the uh, revenue would be. Any thoughts on stadium issues? Well, you know, I don't think you have a hearing until you can get some kind of consensus going and then uh, bring it before the committees. Uh, uh, I always thought it was going to happen at some point this session, but I'm, I, I don't know. I don't know. One of the problems is if if we don't do it now, I think you know hopefully the economy is going to come back, and the costs are going to go way up, and the interest rates are going to go way up. We really should be doing it now, building it right now, uh, when we're kind of still in a very stagnant economy. Oh, I, you know, I would just say it. Uh and this is tough work, uh, but here we are. I, th I think I think we were talking about the stadium when I first came in here in 2003, or it was uh, shortly thereafter that uh, that conversation started. But uh, but but even today, we don't have a bill. We don't really have a solid site. We 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 if it's going to be Minneapolis, we don't have that kind of worked out. So uh, there's just a lot of a lot of ifs in in, in all of this right now, and. Uh, I keep hearing we're going to get a bill, we're going to get a bill, but, uh, you know, until we see one, why, uh, I have to wonder. You, you know, know, I was... Oh. Uh, we, we passed a bill in the Senate that had both the Vikings and the Twins in it, it but it, uh, it didn't uh, get very far. about that, yeah. You know, uh, we had a... Uh, I was there when the Metrodome was built, and same issues, uh, debate about location, 
And uh, what we did in the end, we set up a special commission. Uh, I think it was five members, uh, something close to that at any rate. And there was like one member from West Metro, one from East Metro, and three members from Greater Minnesota. And they were charged with the site selection because at the time there was the Bloomington Stadium and they wanted to retain a stadium at that location. Uh, St. Paul, it was the Midway site, and Minneapolis wanted it downtown. And uh, those were kind of the big three that were under discussion. But then Brooklyn Center, the Earl Brown Farm, uh, they had a proposal as well as I think one up in Coon Rapids. And the legislature just got bogged down in terms of where it was going to be. And then, of course, we had the same kinds of issues we have today. It didn't involve gaming, but what the source of revenue would be for the stadium. And when I say there hasn't been a hearing, and I think everybody agrees here that uh, before there probably is going to be a hearing, there has to be some consensus around a process to find a site select or do a site selection or uh, consensus about what the source of revenue would ultimately be. Representative Hobbs, any thoughts on this? I think they've said everything. Very well, good. Actually, I have to correct myself because uh, uh, Senator Chamberlain, uh, being uh, Senator Hand, and Senator Pam Wolf have put together a bill and introduced it. Uh, it doesn't involve uh, any state funding. It, it sort of works within the system to try to uh, uh, come up with the money to pay the bonds. Uh, I, I, I don't know it in great detail yet, but uh, I, I think I did indicate there, there was no bill, but that's incorrect. There, there is a bill, and so... Uh, you know, I suspect at some point uh, one of the uh, probably the local government and the committee will, will will take a committee rather than the Senate will take a look at that and uh, and see if it's got uh, legs at all. But uh, I know Senator Hand, Senator Chamberlain, Pam Wolf have have worked quite diligently on that for probably a couple of months. The uh, the one thing they're silent on though is what the location would be, and that's right, one exactly. of the uh, one of the issues that yeah. would have to be resolved. Yeah. Uh, Viewer from Rochester, uh, we'll go to you, Senator Senjum, uh, has a question. It's really more, more about uh, budgeting and accounting, but the, the viewer's question is, uh, we had a billion-dollar-plus deficit. Now there are millions they just found. Who keeps the books? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think there's some frustration on the viewer's, parts about, uh, viewer's part about the swing in forecasts. And maybe uh, you could take a moment and just kind of explain how that, um, you know, how that process works and and who makes the determination that it looks like we're going to have a, a surplus or going to have a deficit, and why there is that variability. And our veteran legislators, I'm sure, have views <laughs> on that as well. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure any one of us can really understand it because, uh, you know, as we went from a $5 billion uh, deficit to a one, nearly $1 billion surplus, uh, I think uh, everyone in Minnesota was uh, surprised, including the Director of Management and Budget, uh, that was uh, that was a big wall, and uh, that kind of a swing doesn't happen that often within that short a period of time. But you know, it, it did honestly have, uh, I think, something to do with uh, with uh, you know, we made some we made some hard decisions on some cuts last last uh, time. We maybe got a little uptick in the economy. There were some capital gains uh, within that, uh, but it, uh, it it was I think unforeseen by by all of us. Uh, in fact, the general conjecture was that we're we're going to be not not certainly move towards a, a surplus, but uh, maybe even go a little deeper into a deficit, uh, uh, just in advance of the forecast coming out. So, it is a wild and woolly process uh, uh, managed by you know the, the management and budget people, along with the uh, other economists that help out. But uh, it's uh, it's one of those things that uh, bobs and weaves, and we can only hope that it. Uh, uh, the bobbing is over, and the, and the weaving going forward is positive, and uh, we uh, continue on this mark. You know, I, uh, I have a slightly different take on the, uh, the swing uh, that the senator just described. Uh, you have to keep in mind that uh, a big part of that number that uh, he referenced uh, was a delay in payment to school districts. It was also the issuing of what we call the tobacco bonds at 700 or $750 million dollars. So when you look at uh, what the obligations are based on the November forecast, uh, the shortfall at the beginning of the next biennium is $1.2 billion in that forecast. And then there's the uh, amount or the dollars that show the school districts, which bring it to $4.2 billion. And that's before you have any discussion about any inflationary pressures or anything like that. Um, and it was the use of one-time money that, that brought about that 
positive number. You know, just a few weeks prior to uh, the November forecast, those tobacco bonds were issued at seven, 750 million, somewhere in that range. And uh, if I recall correctly, it was roughly, uh, roughly a, uh, an 850 million budget uh, uh, increase, if you will, that second uh, for the second year now. And so, if you take a look at the bonds that were issued, and if you were to subtract that 700 or 750 from that 859, it wasn't as big a growth as a lot of us would like to wish that it were. But having said that, the February forecast comes out. Uh, Early uh, next week, uh, we'll have the first hearing in the Ways and Means Committee next Thursday night. And sometimes there are major swings with that, with that forecast if the economy and so on is picking up. Uh, we do get a monthly uh, report, both bodies do, uh, in terms of the amount of revenue that's coming in. And uh, uh, some tax revenue, some categories are up and some are down. And it appears from my take on it, uh, looking at those numbers uh, over the years, that it probably isn't going to be a major major change from November. But having said that, sometimes I've been surprised. Well, you know, uh, with the tobacco bonds and the school age shift, we really deficit finance to the tune of a billion three hundred and forty million. Now we come up with eight hundred and seventy six million, and we say it's a surplus. <coughs> it, it actually came up to about sixty percent of what we actually uh, deficit spent. Now it would be great if by the end of the biennium the revenues would match the these expenditures, and maybe they will. But uh, when we left last summer, we were deficit financing to the tune of about one and a third billion. Well, it's my understanding. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Carlson. But um, some of what our surplus is is because we've spent less than what they projected. Now, there, you can talk about the tobacco bonds and everything else, but part of the, that calculation was we actually spent less than what was projected, which is a good thing if we spent less than what we thought we would. I think one other problem we did have, and uh, I think it's basically uh, in the negotiations between the governor and the leaderships, was that we really didn't do a lot of adjusting in the next biennium in what we call tails. We kind of left that alone. I think there could have been some adjustments that might have helped that next biennium's outlook, whether or not we should have or shouldn't have, we could have. Uh, and still, we did borrow the money and we did do the school yeah. shift. The, the biggest one there that that there was some unexpected savings was health and human services. Right. It wasn't as expensive as the projections and, and the department right. had indicated we would need. So that, yes, you're correct, there was uh, yeah. some savings there. Well, you know, and I, this actually ties into a question we have from a viewer in Stewartville who would like to see a more progressive tax system uh, be installed. Um, he says be reinstalled, but a more progressive tax system. I, I seem to recall some conversation in past years that some of the swings has to have to do with uh, um, a reasonably progressive tax structure and not a sales tax that is as large as it is in some other states in terms of the base. Is that also an issue here? And maybe we can discuss the Stewartville viewers' question as well. We'd like to see a, a more progressive tax structure. What the panel well, thinks of The more that. progressive, a lot of times, is the one that's got the big roller right, coaster. And that's, uh, right, and that's I why mean, I'm yeah. raising the issue here, because it seems to me that it seems to me that's been something we've talked about yeah, in the past. Uh, uh, broadening the sales tax would probably do more to stabilize than anything else, but that isn't very progressive. It isn't necessarily regressive, but uh, it isn't progressive. But you, the more progressive you get, the more uh, the roller coaster uh, gives us trouble. And this the, is, go ahead, I'm sorry, Representative Carlson. No, I was just going to say we had a uh, presentation just yesterday uh, by the Commissioner of uh, revenue before the tax committee, and he had uh, two stools. He did some visuals. In fact, I asked him if he'd been a teacher at one time, and he said he had, because uh, that's my background as well. But he did have the visuals there, and he showed a three-legged stool, uh, and uh, the way the tax revenue came in from the big three, uh, sales, property, and uh, income, and the stool was balanced. And then he showed the way the stool looks currently, and it won't stand on the three legs. But the uh, big drop was in the sales tax, which uh, I think historically we always thought that that would be the more stable. But uh, 
in this case, it hasn't been. And if you listen to, you know, the discussion and uh, different uh, political leaders and business leaders encouraging people to spend more and so on, part of what they're talking about is creating the demand. But uh, in terms of the state budget, when uh, consumer demand drops, sales tax revenue drops. So uh, it does, it is a bit surprising because uh, Senator Langseth is absolutely right. You know, historically and in most uh, downswings, it's been the income tax that was the most volatile, but this time it's the sales tax that's creating some problems. Well, I think one of the reasons that it's volatile in the sales tax is that uh, I think most importantly, people uh, on a national and a state level are just unsure of what the future brings. And I, I think they're cautious about spending money. They're, they're waiting. They're saving. They just don't know what those darn politicians are going to do from either party. And I think what they want more than anything else is some sort of consistency or at least the hope of consistency, whether it's a slight increase in taxes, slight decrease. They want to see some sort of consistent straight line in more than two years. One year isn't enough for families to plan or even businesses to plan ahead. Well, you know, nationally, before the meltdown, the average household was spending 6% more than they were making. They were running up credit cards and yeah. everything. Okay, tough times come. Then they got scared and pulled in, dropped to about 6% saving. That's mm -hmm. a 12% difference. Yes. Right now, it's about a 4% saving. And so uh, one of our problems was that we were so exuberant years back that just getting down to probably about where we should be on the savings rate is uh, <laughs> it, it causes revenues to go down quite substantially. Well, Senator Langseth, I think we're old enough to remember how our parents did things, and they were cautious, and I think the uh, younger generations of today want that cell phone or laptop or a iPad tomorrow, whether or not they have the money they want it tomorrow. Whether that's a good thing or not, I'm not sure. <laughs> Senator Sinjo, any thoughts? Well, you know, I, I would just say for as long as I've watched programs like this, uh, we, uh, we tend to think that, you know, if we can tinker with this thing a little bit, uh, we can fix it, then the motor will run again uh, like it should. And, uh, and that will be uh, something that politicians try to do to the end of time, I suspect. And we're in the tinkering business, but uh, I think we really need to kind of, uh, and I think we all agree, you know, the, the way out of, any malady that we might have right now is uh, more people working, more people with jobs, uh, more people in our labor force paying taxes, and, 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 and if we can work towards that direction, I'm not going to suggest it's easy, but you know, part of it's tax climate, part of it's regulatory uh, uh, related, part of it's certainly a strong part of it's workforce, making sure that we have a strong workforce in Minnesota. Uh, I think that's, that's the path that we need to go down in terms of uh, bringing a state to where we all want to be, and I think we can get there, you know, collectively working together. Going back to the, the question that was really asked about a progressive tax system, um, you know, if you look at the tax incident study, uh, there's a variety of uh, information that's available that show that uh, our tax system in Minnesota has grown more regressive, and part of that has been a growing reliance on the property tax, and it goes back to that I think it was the first or second question we had about the uh, restoration of the homestead credit, uh, the sensitivity to the property tax. And uh, we all know that that's the most uh, regressive tax. And we did do a number of things, uh, really going back uh, to the Harold Lavander years, uh, to uh, try to make uh, that particular tax with things like the homestead credit and so on more progressive. And then there's the whole question, should we uh, rely more on the uh, the income tax uh, than the property tax and or the sales tax, but uh, the tax system has grown more regressive in the last uh, whole decade, decade and a half. One way to address this viewer's question would be to say, and I want the panel to correct me if I'm wrong on this, but normally when you look at major changes to the tax structure, that would be an odd numbered session year activity. Would that be a fair statement? Normally you would be the, yes. it would, normally you would see that next year. So those, those are the big yeah. budget yeah. years. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we have a viewer who wants to, from, we actually had this question last week and didn't get to it. The viewer again from Pelican Rapids wants to know, uh, what do we think of the Castle Doctrine proposal? And I, uh, for our viewers who are wondering what that has to do, that has to do with uh, uh, certain pending bills relating to um, the use of firearms and uh, for protection and so forth. I, I think, first of all, we need to have somebody 
who can describe what, what's happening in the legislature on this issue, and then we can talk a little bit about it. Who wants to take a run at it? I'll take a run at it. I, I think it's moving through. Uh, I'm going to guess that it'll, it'll be sent to the governor. Um, I think the Castle Doctrine is being misrepresented and mis... People are... It's not being put forward correctly. It's, it's, they always talk about guns. Let's say you're a woman who just got into a car in a dark parking ramp. You got in, you put the key in the ignition, you, you turned it on, but you haven't put it in gear yet where the doors automatically lock. Somebody opens the door and grabs you. If you back up your car real quickly, slam it in reverse and back up, and run that person over with your car, and then, if God forbid, you run over them one more time to make sure they're not going to hurt you, you might spend the night in jail until they figure out if you killed that person intentionally or if they were actually trying to attack you. That's the castle doctrine. You can protect your life when it's you're threatened with your life. It doesn't have to be a gun. It could be a baseball bat. It could be a butter knife. Uh, whether I like the castle, I, I don't like the way the castle doctrine is being presented. It, makes it look like, what do people call it, uh, shoot uh, first. first and ask questions later. There's always that cloud. There's always that uh, suspicion or indecision. But I just don't like the way it's presented, because there are instances where some form of that, I think, w would be helpful. Well, I've uh, been in the legislature for 36 years, and I've always voted with the NRA, but I didn't on this one. I thought this one was just going too far. Uh, we had a situation uh, uh, where there was this young guy, I think he was 19 years old, he was, he was drunk and he went into one apartment and they chased him out and went into another one and the, the guy asked him uh, to leave and he didn't, so the guy shot and killed him. Well, obviously the young guy shouldn't have been in the apartment, we know that, but he didn't have a gun, he didn't have a club, uh, he didn't have a knife. Uh, should he have been shot and killed? And I just think this one went beyond what we really should be doing when it comes to uh, protecting ourselves. I, I just, I, I read the bill and, and I decided this is the one I'm not going to be voting for. I, uh, I have a lot of concerns about it and uh, one of the things I'd like to point out is that the uh, law enforcement uh, community is uh, very opposed to uh, the Castle Doctrine, they have a lot of concerns in, in the risks that would be inherent uh, with uh, some of the things that uh, Rep. Senator uh, Langseth uh, just described. It'll probably be one that's going to be hotly debated uh, when it hits the uh, House floor, but um, I know that personally I have a lot of constituents uh, that are very concerned about what that would mean, and there may be somewhat of a metro-rural part of that debate as well. Yeah. Which Reverend is often Carlson, what happens with guns. Uh, one second, Senator. Someone told me we passed that off the House floor last year. You did. Senator yeah, the yeah, Senate. Right. Yeah. And it passed the Senate but today. It, but I don't yeah. remember that. But obviously we did. Yeah. But it, it comes back, though, I think, doesn't it? Does, does it come back? Yeah, yeah it'll go yeah. back. Yeah. 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 It, it, there probably is a, some difference. There, 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 was, there was an amendment yeah. offered uh, okay. that, that dealt uh, to, to uh, sort of get at the, you know, the police issue and the concerns that they have. Okay. It may not yeah. certainly have been... Totally satisfactory, but it did. It, it and that's to, what I mean when, the, do when the bill comes back now, it'll yeah. be a little different. Yeah. A lively discussion, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, it did pass uh, off the floor 40 to 23. Democrats, Republicans certainly voted for it. Obviously, the majority were Republicans uh, in, in this case. Uh, and it just, uh, it, it seems to me, it, it you know, it, it's the rights of the criminal versus the rights of the, of, 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 of the citizen. And... Uh, and these are tough calls, there's no question about it, but it seemed to me at this point that uh, for the most part, uh, in those kind of threatening situations that the, uh, that the criminal, uh, in, in some cases, as described in the testimony, uh, had some rights that uh, were advanced over the, the rights of the person that was under attack. And uh, this, I think, tends to even it up. Uh, it may not be a perfect bill, but uh, it, uh, I think, is one that is important. I will just say from the standpoint of uh, where I live, uh, it's probably a mixed thing. There, probably in in in, in the cities, uh, those folks are maybe a little bit more sensitive about guns and things like that. And and then in the rural area, though, uh, where it takes uh, maybe 20 minutes, 25, maybe half an hour, perhaps even longer, to get a uh, a sheriff's deputy into a a, a rural location, uh, 
uh, there were a, a lot of people that said this is a good idea and, and we ought to do it, including deputy sheriffs that uh, themselves uh, admitted that this is something that was important uh, and that would assist them in, in those kind of situations. The, uh, the other thing I just offer too, there's certainly a lot of debate on the floor about you know all, all of these hypotheticals happening. It much uh, felt like uh, a few years ago when we were doing concealed carry and 90,000 people were going to die on the streets of Minnesota because we were doing this. Uh, that, of course, didn't happen. And, and so there, were, there was a lot of that and, uh, going on in terms of, of the what is, the, hypo, the hypothetical, uh, hypotheticals. I, I, I don't think uh, Minnesota, as it's, uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen pointed out, uh, uh, generally speaking, they show good judgment and do the right thing under the right situations. I like guess just saying that it's the criminal versus the uh, the homeowner or whatever it is. Uh, I, I, if that if it were that simple, I would have voted for it. But this young guy that I'm talking about, I don't think was a criminal. I guess you could say he committed a crime by walking into this person's unlocked door, but uh, I wouldn't classify him as a criminal. And yet now he's dead. So I, that's the kind of thing that I was concerned about. And I think, uh, you know, when I say the law enforcement community is very concerned about it and very uh, opposed, although I'm sure there's some variance from mm -hmm. officer to officer, but, uh, you know, they're concerned about uh, their line of work and what that might mean when they're in an emergency situation. And uh, also there uh, is that chance that uh, it could be an innocent person that uh, is uh, caught in the line of fire and uh, somebody that's uh, not a criminal, but uh, somebody misunderstands what is about to happen and something happens and if you get an innocent person killed that's um, something that uh, we would all or I would certainly hate to have to live with. Well we will uh, we'll have an opportunity from everything I've heard tonight to talk about this issue again before we're done for the year I suspect it's going to come back. Um, so having had one controversial issue let's have another one. A viewer from Brainerd uh, wants to uh, talk about photo ID. This viewer thinks we need photo IDs for hunting and fishing licenses. Why not for voting? I don't happen to have uh, some questions from other viewers but I know we've had other questions from viewers that take the opposite view on that. So I suspect that there's some disagreement on that point. <laughs> Who wants to take a run at it? I'll take the counter view. Uh, most people over 80 years old don't have either a driver's license or an ID. Uh, what would it be like for that a person who had been voting for 70 years walking into their uh, polling booth and uh, they recognize the people there, they, they recognize that person, and yet, well, you can't vote. You don't have the voter ID or the driver's license. Now, obviously, people would have a chance to get this, but uh, my, my mother is 96 years old, and she only has an ID card because my sister got her an ID card. And, uh, and then with college students, they have to go back to wherever their, their driver's license says their address is, which in some cases, well, my grandson just graduated from the University of Minnesota. He would have to drive back uh, uh, 200 and some miles. And how do, how do you vote by mail, which you have been able to with, uh, with uh, absentee ballots, if you have to have a photo ID? So there's, there's, there's two, two different arguments here. And, and I guess I'm just cynical enough, so I think there is some voter suppression of the over 80 and the college students who do tend to vote a certain way. Representative House? Well, I was amazed that uh, I think it was about eight weeks ago, my wife and I went to the optometrist in Walker to get our, our eyes looked at and stuff. And I, I went back there a week later to uh, pick up my uh, contact lenses. and. They wanted a photo ID. They wouldn't give them my give me the prescription or the uh, or or the insurance forms without a photo ID. And I said, you know who I am. And I know, but uh, the the new law with the insurance company said we have to have a photo ID. Now, if I go cash a check when I'm down in the cities, which I rarely do, or uh, do something like that, I'm asked for a photo ID. I think the issue with college students would be very easy to fix, simply uh, allow the uh, colleges and universities to issue a student ID, verify that they live within uh, that district, and uh, make sure that the, the university knows that it is their responsibility to make sure they give it to the correct person. 
Same with nursing homes. We could allow nursing homes the authority to have the management uh, make sure that they had photo IDs and also make the uh, nursing home management responsible that they issue them in the correct way. I don't see it as a big problem. I think it can be, uh, those caveats can be fixed. And I believe in the states that they use it, it hasn't been a problem. Well, the, the bill, with all due respect, uh, that uh, passed the House and the Senate and was vetoed by the governor uh, didn't make those accommodations. Um, you know, to reinforce what uh, Senator Langseth was saying, the uh, information that uh, we had at the time was about 18 percent of the senior citizens do not have a photo ID with the correct address. You, you got to put the two together. That's a part of this. And uh, young voters between 18 and 25, the percentage is very similar that wouldn't have a photo ID with the uh, correct address. So uh, you would have uh, people that would be being denied the uh, the right to vote. And uh, I used on the House floor, my mother is an example, when she wanted to get a passport, um, she was born in Austin, Minnesota. Family was uh, one of the very original uh, settlers in Austin. She happened to be a home birth. Hmm. And she was attended by a medical doctor. He went back to the office, apparently, and didn't uh, file a birth certificate. Paperwork was a and problem even then. That's right. <laughs> and it took uh, roughly two years uh, because there's quite a uh, process that you have to go through. And even the Austin newspaper, when she did some research there, only said that a baby girl was born on uh, her birth date in Austin, Minnesota. It didn't give an address. It didn't give a name, just that this baby girl had been born. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, you had to get some census records. You had to uh, get some affidavits by two older brothers. But it took roughly two years. And uh, the point I made it on the House floor is that the election would have been long over if it would have been an, an ID required uh, or required for uh, voting purposes. So I think we have to be very careful when we set up a system that would deny people the uh, right to vote that uh, are citizens of the state of Minnesota. And let me just say, uh, you know, the, the question on the ballot will be, should uh, people in the process of voting show, flow, uh, show a, uh, a photo ID, uh, yes or no? And, and then the enacting language that makes all this happen, generally speaking, will occur in, in the next legislature. And it will occur through the statutory process. And so all of this is going to have to shake and bake, if you will, within that process. Uh, and there's going to have to be agreement there. Uh, or on, on all of these questions. And I will tell you, I don't care which side you're on, uh, you, know, you fundamentally want everybody to vote. Uh, I, I think that's something that uh, all sides can agree on. And, and, and we're going to have to work in that direction if this thing passes and uh, the basic question passes about showing the ID. So I, I'm not terribly worried. This, is, uh, this has got a long way to go. But if the people of Minnesota and the polls would suggest right now that yes, uh, they would prefer a system wherein photo IDs are shown. And, and if that's the case, if that would uh, resolve itself in that direction in the election, we'll go forward and, and develop the enacting language. And it's going to have to be good or it's not going to stand uh, uh, the process, uh, be it the uh, legislative process, uh, gubernatorial veto, whatever it might be. Well, I think I'd feel a lot better about it if we had the, the legislation the suggested legislation in place now. Uh, I, I just just to say that that, that we will pass this uh, this amendment to the Constitution, and then we will decide later how to do it. You made some suggestions that I thought were pretty good, you know, and I think uh, if we could do those things, then I, I would feel more comfortable about it. Well, I would say every every meeting that, that has been had on this, and uh, I'm not on these respective committees, but I know it's it's directed towards. Uh, the whole question of voter suppression and, and how to avoid that. And I think good people will come together. Uh, ideas are going to surface certainly during these hearings uh, as they have. And, uh, but going forward, as, uh, should it pass, it, the enacting language will actually occur next year. And that's frankly the way it, you're not going to develop an acting language absent you know, the requirement to do it. Viewer, uh, go ahead, do you want to say it? No. Viewer from Elbow Lake wants to know what our panel's position is on term limits for legislators. Uh, I'm going to start with you, uh, <laughs> Representative Carlson, in part because um, I know from my own experience, um, sort of being in and around the public life, that this question of term limits goes back to the 1970s, 1980s. And I'm sure that you've had conversations in the legislature about it. What's your, what's your thought well, on this? Well, the, uh, 
the last time it was uh, proposed uh, in a somewhat serious way, I think, was when uh, Governor Carlson was in office. He had a uh, proposal uh, dealing with uh, term limits. Um, you know, I, in, in uh, one of the ways I would answer that, and I've served 20 terms, is that uh, I stand for election uh, every two years. And uh, that's uh, an opportunity if you're uh, not doing the job that your constituents uh, feel you should be doing, uh, where they can turn you out of office. And there's a fair amount, or I shouldn't say a fair amount, there is a major, if you look at, uh, there was one study a few years ago, a 10-year period, the uh, turnover within that 10-year uh, period previous to the study had been something like 76 percent of the legislators uh, had uh, left office either voluntarily or were defeated in an election. So it's not as though you don't get uh, fresh blood in the uh, system. And I think you have to have some institutional memory. There's some advantage uh, to that. And uh, some of the states, it just hasn't worked very well. With the California being a state where some experts have contended there have been issues as a result of term limits. Yeah. I was just look, today looking through the blue book, and I found figured out that uh, of those that were elected in 2002 in the Senate, 37 of the 67 are not there anymore. You know, so you really do have a, a, a variety of people, and I think you need to have a few of us around who have been through the ups and the downs to make some suggestions about how it was handled right in the past or wrong in the past. But if you really look at it, there is term limits. It's elections, and, and most people don't serve and, 10 years. And just to, get to, just to be clear on this, there's no constitutional amendment pending on this issue now. Is, am I correct? Right. No. Okay. Right. We're going to close out our program with a comment to Senator Langseth from uh, a former Fergus Falls mayor who I think would be known to you. Uh, Russ Anderson, who called uh, the program specifically with no question, but to thank you for your service to the people of your area and to the state of Minnesota. And on behalf of our program, I want to thank you for spending our time, spending your time, your Thursday evenings with us. You get 15 seconds or so to say something. <laughs> and then we're well, thank you. I, I, I am going to miss. Uh, I am going to miss it. I know that. But uh, I will be 75 years old in January. My wife is the same age as I am. Uh, we've been married for 54 and a half years, and, and I'd like to make it 75 years if possible. Very good. <laughs> On that note, I want to thank our panel for joining us this evening. Thank you, the viewers, for being with us, and invite you to come back next week when we'll be returning again with another panel on your legislature. Thank you, and good night. There's much more about your legislators online at pioneer.org. Find out more about the history of the program, who's been a guest, and watch all our past episodes. There's also a photo gallery, informative links, and much more. You can also get involved and stay in touch by following us on Twitter and join the discussion on our Facebook page. Thank you for watching Your Legislators. Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of MEEP members, making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans.